the opportunity to be here today. It's uh, a great opportunity to talk about space exploration, specifically the commercial crew program. Um, I do want to start with talking a little bit about where NASA is going, and this will lead well with what Larry's going to talk about in a couple minutes, too. When you look at NASA's vision for space exploration, um, it's really about first establishing a, a presence in low Earth orbit, which the International Space Station has done, and there are six crew members flying today up in the International Space Station. And then the intent was to turn over transportation, crew, and cargo to commercial entities to lower the cost to serve the space station. And in doing so, it allowed NASA to free up the funds they needed to really focus their investment on the harder part of exploration, which is deep space exploration. And that's where, where uh, the Space Launch System and Orion come in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, or at least later we'll talk about Orion later. So that, I wanted to start with a little overview about NASA. And I wanted to show, let's see if the charts come up. First chart. One more. So when I talk about NASA's vision of exploration, Boeing actually plays a significant role in partnering with NASA on the majority of those elements. But then our division in Houston, we actually support the International Space Station. We have had the sustaining contract since the initial development phase and through the operational phase of space station. There's a lot of great research going on in station. When we talk about the benefits of space, Space Station has really yielded a lot of those benefits, from everything from osteoporosis uh, medicine to um, studies around ocular uh, deformation in orbit. There's a, I don't, I don't know if everybody's heard, but there's an experiment going on shortly where the astronauts will spend a year in space so that they can prepare for the deep space explorations. So there's a lot of leverage that the government's getting out of the International Space Station to prep for deep space exploration. The other piece that we play on is the uh, core stage, or the the first stage and the second stage of the space launch system. We do that out of our Huntsville facility in Alabama. And then the final piece is we are um, one of the providers for commercial crew transportation. And that bridges itself into cargo as well. So that's the portfolio that we manage out of our division in Houston. So I'm going to go ahead and pop into a video here real quick. talk about first is, um, you know, we talk about commercial space. And I want to give you a little definition about the basis behind commercial crew or commercial cargo with, with NASA's contracted with industry to do. You know, the legacy pursuits that NASA's done around exploration like Apollo, Mercury, Shuttle, were all traditional procurements, very much where NASA owned the, the total system integration of the capability. And then it would, it would let contracts out to the contracting community to provide subsystems to help build those piece parts. And then NASA would bring it together and then they would sell it, or they would, they would operate it as a service. What commercial is, is a, a change in a contracting approach in where NASA is no longer a system integrator. 
what they are doing is they are setting top level requirements and then they're letting those down on the commercial community to go find the best solution possible to achieve those requirements. And when you, when you do that, it really increases the decision velocity that happens inside the design cycle of the um, contractor community. And that enables you to do it at a fraction of the cost of what a traditional development contract might be. And so that's really what commercial is. And when we talk about commercial crew, um, Boeing and SpaceX were the two that were awarded the recent contract to actually complete the development phase and, and complete uh, several development launches leading up to an operational system. So we'll talk through each of the pieces of what our solution is. When you look at what Boeing provides, this is our CONOPS or operational concepts. Um, we actually, and I'll talk a little bit more about these in detail, but we do our pre-processing down at Cape, Can uh, Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center. And our mission ops is uh, controlled out actually out of the mission ops directorate, or, or now I guess it's the flight ops directorate at Johnson Space Center. And we actually launch on top of an Atlas V rocket. When you look at the Atlas V, we picked that specifically because it has, to date, it has 52 successful launches. It's 100% reliable and it's demonstrated its performance. And actually, the basis of that vehicle is the original Atlas vehicle that flew the early uh, space missions. So we launch on the Atlas V out of, um, out of Cape Canaveral, and then we'll uh, rendezvous with station roughly in about eight hours. That's a normal, typical mission. We have the operability, or we have the capability to uh, delay it for two days before docking, but traditionally we want to be able to dock within eight hours. We then um, are on station through the duration of the crew transfer, so it's about a six-month stay, and then that same crew will come down with the vehicle. We'll separate our service module, which will re-enter and burn up on re-entry. We uh, then re-enter and we actually uh, land via parachutes on airbags. And uh, when you look at the airbags, we actually have five sites that we've designated inside the U.S. where we can land. Our primary sites uh, is uh, New Mexico at White Sands Missile Range. And it's a very nominal landing when you land on the airbags. We'll talk more about that. Then we refurbish the capsule because the capsule can fly up to 10 times. We build a new service module, and then it goes back through the cycle. So this is a picture of Cape Canaveral, which I talked about. The, the picture on the bottom left actually used to be the orbital processing facility number three. It has been um, completely uh, gutted of all the original shuttle structure by Space Florida, and now we are actually putting all of our tooling in place to start putting uh, service modules and crew modules through there for production. We actually have um, over 100 parts there. Now we're actually starting to build up our first vehicle, which will be completed this uh, middle of this year to go into our structural test article, or as part of our structural test article. The, the picture on the right is the um, launch site for the Atlas V rocket. The, the one mod they have to do for crew is they actually have to put up a service tower. We actually are breaking ground here on Friday out at Cape Canaveral, and we're gonna start producing that in parallel to their standard launch traffic that they're doing down at the Cape. And that'll, that'll take roughly uh, between now and 2016 to complete. So this is a, a picture of the um, interior design of the spacecraft. You know, we, we've done a lot of innovative things when you look at the cockpit. Um, first off, we've gone from about hundreds of switches and dials down to about tens of switches and dials in terms of the interface that the astronaut needs to do with the vehicle. The vehicle is fully autonomous, so it actually can fly all by itself, which leads well to cargo and crew missions. It allows pilot in the loop for observation and override capability in the case of emergency. So the pilot can always command it as needed. Uh, we, we used a lot of leverage components from our Apache helicopter program in the cockpit, and we've also engaged with our uh, Boeing commercial aircraft company on the uh, sky interior as well as some future interior designs that we're looking at for commercial application. So this is a picture of the parachute landing. We've done quite a, uh, quite a few of these tests out at, um, it's actually in the desert, not quite White Sands, but the, the desert um, north of Las Vegas, Nevada. We, we do drops off of uh, large helicopters, and it's amazing to watch. Uh, I don't know if you're a golfer like I am, but it's like hitting a wedge on the green, how it just sticks when it hits. It's amazing the, how it comes down softly and just lands and stops. You know, we use land landing uh, for several reasons. One is you don't have to deal with the potential risks of water intrusion, which is a bad thing to have for astronauts. It also avoids corrosion of salt water, because you can land it on land, uh, so that we can reuse the system multiple times. 
However, we have set it up such that we can land in water for the reason that when you launch out of Cape Canaveral, there are several abort zones where I would have to land in the water in case I had a bad day on the launch vehicle. So we have done a, several um, water-based testing at the Bigelow Aerospace Facility in Las Vegas, Nevada. We actually have uh, more testing coming up there as well as we're leveraging the test facility that was put at Langley, Langley uh, for Orion, and we're going to be doing some off-nominal landing tests in water to validate the airbags and the, uh, the tip-over design. Um, this is a picture you saw it in the video. This is the abort engine. Unlike traditional vehicles that have a polar abort system, for our system we use a um, pusher abort. So it's a propulsive system below the service module that pushes the vehicle off of the second stage of the rocket. We're using the existing Bantam engines that are built by Ro uh, Pratt Whitney Rockdyne. I'm uh, sorry, I should say Aerojet Rockdyne. <laughs> I still haven't gotten that in my mix yet. But, um, and it's, it's uh, amazing how quickly you can thrust yourself off the rocket and uh, move yourself safely downrange to land in the ocean. The other thing we've been spending a lot of time on is ergonomics, um, dealing with ingress and egress, the ability to get in. Astronauts will wear uh, pressurized suits, so therefore we have to deal with them being able to get out in emergency situations and also dealing with the uh, actual handling of switches and dials. Um, we actually have a lot of uh, nice tablet PCs that we're using that are galaxy-based PCs throughout the cockpit that the astronauts will engage with. We've also spent a lot of time um, with the astronauts, since we're in such close proximity to JSC, we've had the opportunity to have astronauts in our cockpit several times dealing with interfaces and checkouts. The pictures here is um, Randy Bresnik and uh, Serena Anon are kind of our two major astronauts that have spent a lot of time with us working on training as well as crew interface requirements as we work through the final design. So the only work chart I have in here is actually some milestones, and I'll expand on it a little bit. And unfortunately, it looks like it got cut off to the left. But um, we actually, it says 15, we do a certification baseline review. We actually held it last year at the end of the year. That was one of our first two milestones that we've already completed. Um, we have the uh, design certification review that's coming up in 16. And then we have our test sequence where we're going to do a pad abort, and then we do a uncrewed flight to station, and then a crewed flight to station. Uh, they will all happen in 2017, and that will follow by a certification review with NASA that then authorizes us to start flying crews on a commercial service to station. And we are targeting for doing that in 2017. So the other thing we're doing, you know, and I mentioned commercial, the other aspect of commercial is and NASA's, NASA's procuring this as a service. And so the opportunity is where can I sell additional services as either part of a NASA mission or as future missions for this vehicle. And we've been working very closely with Space Adventures who um, is sending Sarah Brightman, I believe, up on a Soyuz here this fall to station for a 10 day stay over. And we continue to work with them on put, potentially putting crew members on with NASA astronauts to do the same thing from a, a US capability. The other thing we're doing is we've been working very closely with Bigelow Aerospace where there may be an opportunity to have a commercial space station, something that either industry or foreign entity that um, doesn't have the, the, the time but does have the money to invest in maybe a capability. And so these are areas that we're looking to further um, expand our customer base in this commercial market. Yeah, the, the one, one comment I'll make, and I'll, I'll set this up as I hand it off, because this is my last chart, as I hand it off to Larry, is commercial crew is very different from Orion. It is a design specifically to go up and down the lower orbit. So when you deal with commercial programs, you want to make sure it's the lowest cost possible for the mission they've asked for. There's a lot of capabilities that aren't in there that, that will be talked about that Orion has. Um, but that is the purpose of it. It was designed specifically for that mission in, in, in mission in mind, and that is how we're able to execute based on the knowledge base we have between shuttle, Mercury, Apollo, all the other programs we've worked on that have gone to Leo. So I'll end with that and look forward to questions. Thank you.